we're going to break down night vision and thermal imaging from the ground up. The story of night vision is kind of full of misconceptions. Maybe it starts with folks lumping night vision and thermal imaging together and then tossing around confusing terms like lens diameter, focal lengths, things that often get mixed up. NETD resolution wavelengths. So let's start from the beginning. Basically, there is the light spectrum all the way to thermal radiation, which we can see with our own eyes with image intensifiers, night vision devices, or thermal cameras. We've got a nice graphic here. It shows the range from 380 to 780 nanometers, with 380 being violet and 780 here on the side red. To the left of 380, it goes into UV light, not really something we care much about it since it mostly just causes a sunburn. And to the right of 780, we go into infrared. The human eye can see roughly from 380 to 780 nanometers. Using night vision devices or image intensifiers like this old Russian tube-based model here, you can see even in near darkness. Same principle applies to clip-ons or monoculars even without active infrared illumination. They can generate a rough image based on residual light. Since not many folks I know use tube devices like this, let's first keep going on the spectrum from the right side, above 780 nanometers, so on this side. Beyond that, the human eye just can't see the infrared light anymore. Here I've got a part with an add-on 850 nanometers illuminator. Maybe you've noticed before with these devices that you can see a faint red glow shining from these illuminators. Just don't stare directly into it because it's brighter than your eyes perceive and it might, may harm your eye without even realizing it. 850 nanometer illuminators are super popular because they give the best range, but the downside is some animals like red deer, roe deer and foxes sometimes might react to that light. Here in Germany we typically don't hunt deer at night, but sometimes hunting is just about spotting game too. Now check on 940 nanometers, like this our infrared torch I've got here. I don't see anything at all anymore. The trade-off? The range is reduced uh, in comparison to 850 nanometers. So basically everybody has to decide what works best for them. I personally have never pushed a big hawk away with 850, so I prefer the better performance and I don't use 940. So how does a night vision device work? Whether tube or digital add-on, it makes use of those wavelengths to produce a pretty clean black and white or black and green image. So now we are continuing to the right on our spectrum, moving past 940 nanometers. That's, I've written it down here, 0 0.00094 millimeters. So just to get an idea how long or short that is. As we go further, the wavelength keeps getting longer, eventually reaching 7,000 to 14,000 nanometers. That's just 0.014 millimeters. Pretty long in comparison, isn't it? And even though we can see those long wavelengths, we can sometimes feel them, like from a furnace. A furnace heats not just by convection, but also through radiant heat, which we find pretty comfortable. That's basically what our thermal cameras see. If the heat is strong enough, you can even feel it. Imagine a 300 pound boar standing suddenly five inches behind you in winter time. You might turn into a thermal imager yourself and suddenly you might feel pretty warm inside. No, just kidding aside. Every object emits some heat, like a tree. It's got stored warmth from the day, heat from the ground or even photosynthesis. Anything above absolute zero, that's zero degrees Kelvin, which equals to minus 273.15 degrees Celsius, emits heat and is getting picked up by our thermal devices. A night vision device, on the other hand, always works with reflected light. Residual or infrared light, you actively shine on the target. From the thermal camera's perspective, every animal's body looks like a glowing lantern behind bush. Great for spotting early, but not necessarily ideal for making a safe shot. 
tiny twigs might just get overlooked and the bullet might get deflected. Thermal cameras can sometimes see through obstacles, but not glass. At about 3000 nanometers, glass just absorbs or reflects infrared radiation. Quick experiment, we've got a thermal camera mounted on our studio camera and I can make myself disappear. So, poof, I'm gone. You might see the reflection of my cameraman depending on the angle, but not me. Ever try to look through a closed window with a thermal camera? Just doesn't work. So how does the thermal radiation actually reach the sensor if it does not pass glass? Simple. The lens of a thermal camera isn't made of glass, it's usually made of germanium. That's a semiconductor, kind of a, like a special kind of glass substitute. It lets the infrared spectrum pass through, so the camera can form a real image of heat radiation in front of it, just like a normal camera does with visible light. Now, because the sensor is always getting heat signals from all directions, like from the housing of your warm hand touching it, it needs to constantly recalibrate it to find kind of a baseline. That's what you hear as the clicking sound sometimes. Basically, right behind the germanium lens, a mechanical shutter briefly closes and each pixel gets reset to zero. When that happens, the image freezes for a split of a second. If you look closely, you will notice the image clears up again right afterwards. If you are worried that the clicking might scare off game, I have actually never seen that happen, but most thermal cameras, almost all of them, let you switch to manual calibration. You can start the process yourself on some models, even let you manually cover the lens so the click doesn't happen at all. For handheld devices, the electronics generate the image on an LCD viewfinder. For clip-ons, the display is just a little bit bigger and aligned to your scope in front of the lens. So your scope's basically looking at the display instead of looking directly at the target. Unlike normal cameras that show color or brightness differences, thermal imaging only shows temperature differences. And here's where that first key spec comes in, NETD and millikelvin. That stands for noise equivalent temperature difference. Basically, it's the smallest temperature difference the camera can detect without being cancelled out by its own system noise. To keep it simple, if I can see the texture of a tree bark or the fur coat of an animal, I'm only seeing the temperature differences that cause those textures. The smaller the NETD number, the more detail I can see, because the camera can pick up even tiny temperature variations. In hunting, typical NETD values range from around 50 to 25 millikelvin. Anything lower usually requires active cool sensors. My personal take, I don't put too much stock in those NETD specs. They are just numbers on paper. Often you don't see those super tiny differences in real life so I don't chase the absolute best. Now an important point, understanding what a thermal camera can do revolves around temperature difference. Basically, we only see differences when they exist, much more depending on environment's temperature than on the NETD. Like a stone in the woods in winter, it transfers the heat from the ground and sticks out from the surrounding snow or leaves because it's warmer. Same with a rotting log or a decay tree. They give off heat, which can be detected from a distance, sometimes tricking you into thinking you are seeing a wildlife target. Using thermal cameras just to find your path on the woods, that's more difficult in summer. For example, a path in winter usually is warmer than the surroundings, but in summer, the same path could be cooler because the leaves around it keep the warmth of the day longer. After long rain, the heat contrasts even out, making it harder to spot your surrounding. That's why we are having settings on the menu like sun and rain. Those adjust the contrast and sharpen the image. Out here during the day, you really get those sharper contrasts. Here I am walking around in our hunting ground. It's a nice 77 degree Fahrenheit and I'm using the fusion mode I recently discovered for day use. What's interesting is that every bit of sunlight filtering through the trees really pops where it hits, giving you these strong highlights. When you factor that in and keep your other eye on the surroundings, 
you can actually scan a bit of the trail and left, right, even in broad daylight and summer. And of course, the cooler it is, the better this works, since you get a stronger temperature difference. To summarize it, a better name for a thermal camera would probably be thermal difference visualizer. Resolution is more important than NETD, and in many cases, that's a number of pixels the camera has to form an image, basically the same like in any digital camera. The most common resolutions now are around 384, like this one, by 288 and 640 by 512 pixels. Decent results usually start around 256 by 192. The best available resolution today is about 1280 by 1024 pixels. That's roughly HD, but in 4 by 3 ratio instead of 16 by 9. Sometimes you'll see a figure called pixel pitch in micrometers. Not super critical for most users. If you multiply pixel pitch by resolution, you get a sense how big or tiny the sensor actually is inside your camera. I've got an example here for a 640 and a 380 resolution, like this. And you can see, for example, this is the sensor size of this camera. Pairing that with focal length gives you a field of view. Everyone familiar with photography knows about crop sensors or full frame. The same idea applies here. The key is to look at the field of view listed for 100 meters or 100 yards. Think about what you want to do with the camera and consider your terrain. For example, one setup, a 25 millimeter lens with an 18.5 yard field of view. Good for detailed work like this one here. Next to it, a wider lens, like a 15 mm a 44 yard field of view. If the specs give you just an angle and degrees, choose the higher number. That's the horizontal field of view and you can calculate the actual view area. I'll leave the formula to calculate that by yourself just below. So it really comes down to this. Either you get a wider field of view with less detail or more detail, but then you sacrifice that wide overview. That's why I always recommend thinking about how you're going to use the device before you buy one. Don't just get dazzled by things like NETD values or high resolution specs. Take the Kyler 2 for example, the big brother of this one. It's got a 15.4 yard field of view and it's a fantastic piece of gear for hunting in wide open fields or the mountains. But if your hunting ground only stretches about 100 yards to the edge of the woods or you're actually planning to use it in the woods, then honestly, it's probably not the right tool for you. Same idea with binoculars. The intended use determines the magnification you need. That's the number that really matters. Now, when you look at Thermal cameras or night vision gear, you will often see the lens diameter listed. But in a lot of cases, what's actually meant is the focal lengths. People confuse the two all the time. Still, if we are talking about the real lens diameter that tells us how much light the lens actually can gather. Bigger lens, more light. It's the same logic like rival scope. A 56 mm scope is going to pull in more light at dusk than a 50 mm. Thermal optics typically sit around f1.1 to 0.9 and the important thing here is the smaller the f number the better the performance. There might have been a little tech talk but as I've heard a lot of misunderstandings before I thought it's a good idea especially for novice hunters to take a moment to explain the basics. If you've got questions or there's something in specific you want to know more about drop it in the comments. I always appreciate your input. I'm a cameraman and a hunter and on this channel we bring together the best of both worlds, hunting and optics. So if that sounds interesting to you, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. It helps the algorithm, boosts our visibility and hey, you know it's free. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.